Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 11th of the 10th month, as we reckon it on our Creator's calendar, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which happens to line up for uh, with December 16th, 2023. And we are going to be taking a little segue and covering a section of the Damascus document, the beginning part of it, that is called the Exhortation. We've read this once before, and I believe when we did, I actually covered what was in the New Translation. There's a paragraph or so that's in fragments that precede this part that we had mentioned, and if you want, you can always check that one. But just for continuity, we're going to read through this. Um, and we're doing that for a, a fellow sister here, but it's actually very edifying for everyone. There's quite a bit in here that answers some questions that help confirm things that we wouldn't otherwise know or have a second witness to in Scripture. One example is what we're going to be covering, Dawid, and the fact that he did not know that you should not accumulate wives, while his son did, and that's why it was never held against him, but the very thing that was foretold that would happen to you happened to his son, because he knew better. We'll find that out when we read this. Another one just real quick that you can keep in mind. In 4th Ezra, it mentions when the northern kingdom was taken into captivity, there was a remnant that repented, chose to break off from the rest of their brethren, to leave and go to a place where no one dwelt to keep the Torah that they wouldn't keep in the land. And Yahuwah held the, the Euphrates back, the northern reaches of it, while they crossed, they went over the Caucasus, into what we call Ukraine and founded Arsareth by the tributary of the Danube. And that was the beginning of what we call the Scythian peoples of the 7th century BC, also known as the Saka. There's a whole lot of history behind it, and there's a lot of evidence that is not actually talked about anymore, but we're going to cover those things if we have a chance. Either way, as we read through this, you'll see facts pointing those out and then a lot more. So I highly encourage you take this to heart, check it with the rest of Scripture, and most importantly, think about it. Just take the time to think about it. This is the exhortation from the Damascus document. Hearken now, all you who know righteousness, and consider the works of Elohim, for he has a dispute with all flesh and will condemn all those who despise him. For when they were untrustworthy and forsook him, he hid his face from Yisrael and his dwelling place and delivered them up to the sword. But remembering the covenant of the forefathers, he left a remnant to Yisrael and did not deliver it up to be destroyed. And in the age of wrath, 390 years after he had given them into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he visited them and caused a plant root to spring from Yisrael and Aharon to inherit his land and to prosper on the toad things of his earth. And they perceived their inequity and recognized that they were guilty men, yet for twenty years they were like blind men groping for the way. And Elohim observed their deeds, that they sought him with all their heart, and he raised for them a teacher of righteousness to guide them in the way of his heart. And he made known to them, or and he made known to the latter generations that which Elohim had done to the latter generation, the congregation of traitors, to those who departed from the way. This was the time of which it is written, like a stubborn heifer, was Yisrael stubborn. Now, this is a, a foretelling for the northern kingdom. But this first part was alluded to in what happened to that generation that rejected him. Right? Given over to Rome and destroyed. Later on it happened because we, the whole body of them generally rejected and then they went into the belly of the beast, just like Yonah. That was when the pagan Celtic and Germanic hordes sacked pagan Rome, broke it into ten kingdoms. The miry feet 
of iron and clay, like the potter's clay. So there's a lot more involved with that stuff as well. However, it says, like a stubborn heifer, thus was Yisrael stubborn. Hosea 4.16 When the scoffer arose who shed over Yisrael the waters of lies, he caused them to wander in a pathless wilderness. That's that word, tohu. Like tohu wabohu, right from the beginning, void and empty. It literally means pathless wilderness, wandering astray to cause confusion. So laying low the everlasting heights, abolishing the ways of righteousness, and removing the boundary with which the forefathers had marked out their inheritance, that he might call down on them the curses of his covenant and deliver them up to the avenging sword of the covenant. If you didn't catch what that meant, because they refused to do his will, he caused them to remove the boundary that the forefathers established and so come under the curses, just like Cain, Canaan who, when they allotted the land, decided to take the inheritance of Shem by force, even though they had given an oath they would not do such a thing. He was told by all of his family he'd be cursed for it, and then he was cursed because he chose to do it. And every one of his family that stayed in the land was completely wiped out or should have been under, the, under that curse. In the very same way, without any deviation, Every one of the sons of Shem that invaded the land of Japheth there in Europe and took it by force and is dwelling there as a tyrant or an occupier uninvited is likewise under this curse. So that's part of the reason why we have to leave these areas. But that's for another time. However, it mentions right here why that happened. For they sought smooth things and preferred illusions, Yeshayahu 30.10. And they watched for breaks, verse 13, and chose the fair neck. And they declared right the wicked and condemned the righteous. And they transgressed the covenant and violated the precept. They banded together against the life of the righteous and loathed all who walked in perfection. They pursued them with the sword, and exalted in the strife of the people. What Yahuwah hates, right? And the anger of Elohim was kindled against their congregation so that he ravaged all their multitude, and their deeds were defilement before him. Hearken now, all you who enter the covenant, and I will unstop your ears concerning the ways of the wicked. Elohim loves knowledge, truth in the mind. Chokmah and comprehension he has set before him, and prudence and knowledge serve him. Patience and much forgiveness are with him towards those who turn from transgression. But power, might, and great flaming wrath by the hand of all the messengers of destruction towards those who depart from the way and abhor the precept. Do you think they're more wicked that that tower fell down or the wall or the ones that had their blood mixed with their offerings? He said, do you know, but unless you repent, you shall all perish in the same. Right? We have to get ourselves out from under the jurisdiction that causes that. They shall have no remnant or survivor. For from the beginning, Elohim chose them not. He knew their deeds before ever they were created, and he hated their generations, and he hid his face from the land until they were consumed. For he knew the years of their coming, and the length and exact duration of their times for all ages to come, and throughout eternity. He knew the happenings of their times throughout all the everlasting years, and in all of them he raised for himself men called by name, that a remnant, sorry, that a remnant might be left to the land, 
and that the face of the land might be filled with their seed. And he made known his set-apart Ruach to them by the hand of his anointed ones, and he proclaimed the truth. But those whom he hated, he led astray. Who's responsible for people getting it or not, right? It's a, it mentions in the Apostolic Constitutions, it is a gift of Elohim to, be, to have belief. It is a, a manifest gift of his Ruach in you just to have belief. And not everybody has that. Hearken now, my sons, and I will uncover your eyes that you may see and comprehend the works of Elohim, that you may choose that which pleases him and reject that which he hates, that you may walk perfectly in all his ways and not follow after thoughts of a guilty inclination and after eyes of lust. For through them, Great men have gone astray, and mighty heroes have stumbled from former times till now. Because they walked in the stubbornness of their heart, the Shemaim watchers fell. They were caught because they did not keep the commandments of Elohim. And their sons also fell, who were tall as cedar trees, and whose bodies were like mountains. All flesh on dry land perished. They were as though they had never been, because they did their own will and did not keep the commandment of their Maker, so that His wrath was kindled against them. Through it, the children of Noah went astray, together with their kin, and were cut off. Abraham did not walk in it, and he was accounted a friend of El, because he kept the commandments of Elohim, and did not choose his own will. And he handed them down to Yitzhak and Yaakob, who kept them, and were recorded as friends of Elohim, and party to the covenant forever. The children of Yaakob strayed through them, and were punished in accordance with their error. They took, their, they took the liberty of their brother, sold them into bondage, right? They, they had caused strife and contention, grieved their father's heart, and the very things that they did happened to them in their lives. They themselves went into to Mitzrayim and their children into bondage, right? Everything recompensed according to what we deserve. And that's why after he brought them out and he's standing before the mountain up with Moshe there, he's telling the truth to them that he requits the inequity of the fathers to the children to the third and fourth of those who hate him. And they had evident fact of that, having just lived through the 215 years in Egypt. <clears throat> it says, And their sons in Mitzrayim walked in the stubbornness of their hearts, conspiring against the commandments of Elohim, and each of them doing that which seemed right in his own eyes. There's a lot more there to get into. I don't really want to break away too far right now. But the history that we have is missing a lot. It was during this time, this, this conspiracy, that you had some of the city-states being founded by Hebrews, but they were going paganized. They were adopting the mystery religions that Egypt had brought out of Babylon. And they were mixing that stuff with their own beliefs or the things they held to in his word. Literally conspiring against the commandments of Elohim and doing what they wanted in their own eyes. And that would be the uh, Greek city-states of old, except for Troy, which was later destroyed. But that's for another time. It says, They ate blood, and he cut off their males in the wilderness. And at, the, and at Kadesh, he said to them, Go up and possess the land, Deuteronomy 9.23. But they chose their own will and did not heed the voice of their Maker, the commands of their Teacher, but murmured in their tents, and the anger of Elohim was kindled against their congregation. Because they're complaining about what's happening, we're told to take everything that happens cheerfully. Whether we're being corrected, whether good or bad, everything comes from His hand, right? Like Job could say, 
Yahuwah gives and Yahuwah takes away, Baruch be the name of Yahuwah now and forever. It says, through it, their sons perished, and through it, their kings were cut off. Through it, their mighty heroes perished, and through it, their land was ravaged. Through it, the first members of the covenant sinned and were delivered up to the sword, because they forsook the covenant of Elohim and chose their own will, and walked in the stubbornness of their own hearts, or their hearts, each of them doing his own will. Yet, with the remnant which held fast to the commandments of Elohim, he made his covenant with Yisrael forever, revealing to them the hidden things in which all Yisrael had gone astray. He unfolded before them his set-apart Sabbaths and his esteemed feasts, the testimonies of his righteousness and the ways of his truth, the desires of his will, which a man must do in order to live, and they dug a well rich in water, and he who despises it shall not live. Yet they wallowed in the sin of man and in the ways of uncleanness, and they said, This is ours. But Elohim in his wonderful mysteries forgave them their sin and pardoned their wickedness, and he built them a sure house in Yisrael whose like has never existed from former times till now. That sure house is waiting for the renewed Shemaim and renewed earth in which righteousness dwells. Those who hold fast to it are destined to live forever, and all the esteem of Adam shall be theirs. As Elohim ordained for them by the hand of the foreteller Yehezkiel, or Ezekiel, saying, The Kohanim, the Luiim, the sons of Zadok, so the Kohenim, right, the, the one that is like the revelation of life, if you want to look at the breakdown, right, but the one who's the servant or the priest, if you will, of the Almighty. The Luiim, the Levites, they call them, are those literally joined unto me, right? And the sons of Zadok are in the form of righteousness. It's not all, but... A particular pattern. Both the literal men at that time and then the ones who fit that in this age. It says, The Kohanim, the Luiim, and the sons of Zadok who kept the charge of my Hekel, when the children of Israel strayed from me, they shall offer me fat and blood. Yechezkiel or Ezekiel. What is that? 4415. The Kohanim are the converts of Yisrael who departed from the land of Yahuda and those who joined them. The sons of Zadok are the elect of Yisrael, the men called by name who shall stand at the end of days. Behold, the exact list of their names according to their generations and the time when they lived and the number of their trials and the years of their sojourn and the exact list of their deeds. And then it breaks off. So we don't have where that is mentioned. But the sons of Zadok are already listed in Chronicles. You have their deeds in the, the kings and Chronicles and the things that they did. But we don't have anything specific other than like Ezra, right? The ones that came later. However, their names are meaningful too. And that's something for another time. I believe there's a gentleman, Scott Whitman, who has some information on those videos where he talks about that. The events that are for men, or mentioned in Yobelim, where they give specific dates, you can look up on the creator's calendar who would have been serving theoretically at that time. And then what their name foretells elucidates the event. And it happens with events from the beginning all the way through to the Exodus with Moshe, all of what you'd call it, the um, history in the book of the Jubilees or Yobelim. And it also follows in suit with our Mashiach's coming, what Kohen could have been serving then, and other events that are mentioned throughout Scripture, if it gives exact dates, and you can find out who would, who would have been there. It's pretty amazing, but 
I don't want to get too too far into that. This is in brackets because it was added for context. It says they were the men of Kodashah, whom Elohim forgave, and who declared right the righteous and condemned the wicked. And until the age is completed according to the number of those years, all who enter after them shall do according to that first interpretation of the law in which the first were instructed. According to the covenant which Elohim made with the forefathers, forgiving their sins, so shall he forgive their sins also. But when the age is completed, according to the number of those years, there shall be no more joining the house of Yahuda, but each man shall stand on his watchtower. The wall is built, the boundary far removed. That's Micah 7 2. So, just to help you out, the sons of Zadok and the things that were happening at the coming of our Mashiach, there was when Herod became king, he was a son of Edom that came to the throne. That was the sign where the lawgiver would not cease until the coming of Sh Shiloh. That was a type and shadow of when Herod took over, because before then it was a governor from Yahuda, and after that time it was uh, the Kohen of the sons of Yahu Yarim, the first order, were also kings and Kohenim, a type and shadow of what was to come, and also there of Yahuda through marriage. That's a phenomenon that you see outside of the land as well, because the things that happened in the land are like a microcosm of world history. If you look at what happened before with the this, this turning away, the idolatry and fall of the people at large in the world, that same thing happened to the children in the land is a microcosm. And the things that happened with the 12 tribes are like what's going on in the world. These are these were fully starting to become known in the 1800s when the fullness of the nations was coming in, the birthright promise of Yaakov to Ephraim, right? Or it was either Yaakov's Baraka or it was Moshe's. But it was when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, the Meloha Goim, is when the veil would start to be lifted. That's what Shaul had said. And literally, when the British Empire, Ephraim, became a nation and company of nations coming to its fullness, they started to comprehend that they were the literal seed of Yahusuf, Ephraim, and known as what you call Israel or Yisrael in the foretellings. They're not the only ones. They're America is the great nation, Manasseh, or the half-tribe, if you will, and Ephraim is the British Commonwealth. But those are two of the 12 that make up the rest of the places in the world. Not every people is from the literal seed, but the ones that they sojourn with are represented there for foretelling purposes, if you will. When you look at the account of what happened to Yahusuf, and then what happened with America and Britain, it's the same pattern. Went into captivity, was controlled for a while, came out, became dominant, and then has helped to establish the rule for Pharaoh in the world or in the land there, where all men, money, and property has been subdued for them. American and Britain has been doing that for the papacy, and Yahusuf did that for Pharaoh. So it's the same patterns. Once you can see these things, people can't lie to you anymore. But it's important that we don't just do, you know, Torah portions and ignore things, but actually read it in context and try to comprehend how it all ties together in the natural progression, right? So back on point, the sons of Zadok, when Herod came, or during this time, 390 years after Babylon, before he came, okay, Antiochus Epiphans, the, the, the chaos that was happening, the restoration for a time, the problems they were having, the sons of Zadok ran to the wilderness. They left to keep the law according to their own dictates. And then while they're in the wilderness, our Mashiach came. America is known as the great wilderness too. But that's another thing for another time. That's mentioned in Revelation. 
says, during all those years, Belial, Belial is the Greek transliteration. It literally means without worth or worthlessness. And it's another title like Satan, Mastema, Samael. These are all titles. This one means worthlessness. So during all those years, worthlessness shall be unleashed against Yisrael, as he spoke by the hand of Yeshayahu, son of Amoz, saying, Terror and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the land. Yeshayahu 24.17 Interpreted These are the three nets of Belial, with which Louis, son of Yaakov, said that he catches Yisrael by setting them up as three kinds of righteousness. The first is fornication, the second is riches, and the third is profanation of the Hekel, or temple. That still goes on today. We are his dwelling place. The profanation of that is the abomination of desolation. Whoever escapes the first is caught in the second, and whoever saves himself from the second is caught in the third. Yeshayahu 24.18 The builders of the wall, from Yechezkiel or Ezekiel 13.10, who have followed after precept, precept was the spouter of whom it is written, they shall surely spout, Micah 2.6 shall be caught in fornication twice by taking a second wife while the first is alive. Whereas the principle of creation is, male and female created he them. So, I'm going to finish reading that and then we're going to get back here. Also, that's Genesis 1.27, right? The establishment of one man, one woman makes one union. Also, those who enter the ark went in two by two. And concerning the prince, it is written, He shall not multiply wives to himself, Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. But Dawid had not read the sealed book of the law, which was in the ark of the covenant. For it was not opened in Israel from the death of Eleazar and Yahushua, and the elders who worshipped Ashtaroth, or the queen of heaven, it was hidden and not revealed until the coming of Zadok, and the deeds of Dawid rose up except for the murder of Uriah, and Elohim left them to him. Meaning, Nescience, he could not know it, it was not attributed to him as a sin. Where there is no Torah, there is no sin. It's exactly what Shaul said. And you can see it here, and you can also see it in the lives of the patriarchs who lived with the law given before the Torah. And also for all the time throughout the Dark Ages where we could not know his word, but you had the fruits of his Ruach in you. They, as Kepha mentions in the recognitions, if there's any remnant of evil left in your body, doesn't matter if it's ignorance or what, intentional or whatever if you're his and there's any remnant of evil left in your body your body has to die so everyone throughout the dark ages who was his who loved who walked in kindness who did the truth who didn't know his name didn't keep the feast they had to die and they did that was the woe of that time that he foretold but there is just as much his as anyone today who knows his name and keeps the feast. That is a fact that is by law. And it's right here where you can see that's established. One thing to keep in mind here, though, this is proof for anyone that we are not to have another wife while the first one is alive. Just like our Mashiach said, that's adultery. And you can find a third witness for this that goes into even more detail in what's called the Shepherd of Hermas where Hermas explicitly asks the shepherd about what to do if a spouse is in adultery, whether you can stay with them or you have to separate, whether or not you can divorce, and if you're allowed to remarry if they die. All of that's covered very clearly. But there's really no excuse for doing otherwise, and this is what one of the reasons the flood came. But people don't want to pay attention to that. 
It says, well, let's continue here. Moreover, they profane the temple because they do not observe the distinction between clean and unclean in accordance with the law. And that's a condemnation against the sons of Louis who were meant to teach them the difference and failed. But lie with a woman who sees her bloody discharge, and each man marries the daughter of his brother or sister. Whereas Moshe said, You shall not approach your mother's sister, she is your mother's near kin. Laikra or Leviticus 18.13 But although the laws, and this is another one, people like to make excuses and compromise because it's not explicitly written. This tells you that if it is in, it's meant one way, it's inferred for every kind. It says, But although the laws against incense are written for men, they also apply to women. When therefore a brother's daughter uncovers the nakedness of her father's brother, she is also his near kin. Furthermore, they defile their set-apart ruach and open their mouth with a blaspheming tongue against the Torah, or Torot, the laws of the covenant of Elohim, saying they are not sure. They speak abominations concerning them. They are all kindlers of fire and lighters of brands. Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 111. Their webs are spiders' webs and their eggs are vipers' eggs. Yeshiyahu, what is it? 59.5. No man that approaches them shall be free from guilt. The more he does so, the guiltier shall he be unless he is pressed. For already in ancient times Elohim visited their deeds, and his anger was kindled against their works. For it is a people of no discernment. It is a nation void of counsel, inasmuch as there is no discernment in them. For in ancient times Moshe and Aharon arose by the hand of the Prince of Lights, a title for Yahushua, or Mashiach. He's also called Melchizedek. And uh, a few other things in contrast to Belial, Melchirasha, and the Prince of Darkness. This is, Moshe and Aharon arose by the hand of the Prince of Lights, and Belial in his cunning raised up Yanis and his brother, the mages of, the magicians of Egypt, right? when Yisrael was first delivered. And at the time of the desolation of the land, there arose removers of the bond who led Yisrael astray, and the land was ravaged because they preached rebellion against the commandments of Elohim by the hand of Moshe, or given by the hand of Moshe and of his set-apart anointed ones. And because they foretold lies to turn Yisrael away from following Elohim, and those were the false foretellers that came about at the time of the captivity of Babylon that Yahu was contending with, if you recall. But Elohim remembered the covenant with the forefathers, and he raised from Aharon men of discernment, and from Yisrael men of Chokmah. That would have been... Yehezkiel, in the land there, right? And Tobiyahu. These are contemporaries of these times, just so you're aware. Literally the son of Aaron, he was the, he should have been Kohen at the time, Ezekiel or Yehezkiel, but he was in the land. And then you have the men of Yisrael with Hokmah, you have Tobiyahu and the Ilk, and he caused them to hearken or to listen to Shema. And they dug the well, the well which the princes dug, which the nobles of the people delved with the stab. Numbers 21, 18. So if you pay careful attention, he's talking about the literal history of the men that were raised up during the captivity in Babylon. He's alluding to how that's tied in with this well that was dug that's foreshadowed or talked about in numbers in their wilderness journey. So 
that's something that you got to keep in mind. They're showing us how these things go together if we pay attention. And then on your own time, I encourage you to read the accounts, go over that, see how these things actually tie together. The well is a law, and those who dug it were the converts of Yisrael, Yisrael, who went out of the land of Yahuda to sojourn in the land of Damascus. The cup of his blood, right? That was a code name for Qumran. Elohim called them in probably literally Damascus too, but they spread out. These were the people of Qumran, falsely called Essenes, but they were the sons of Zadok, as the text shows. Elohim called them all princes because they sought him, and their renown was disputed by no man. The stav is the interpreter of the law of whom Yeshayahu said, he makes a tool for his work. Yeshayahu 54.16 And the nobles of the people are those who come to dig the well with the staves with which the stav ordained that they should walk in all the age of wickedness, and without them they shall find nothing, until he comes who shall teach righteousness at the end of days. None of those brought into the covenant shall enter the temple, or hekel, to light his altar in vain, meaning all those kohenim would not go to the temple to make those offerings anymore. They shall bar the door, for as much as Elohim said, who among you will bar its door? And you shall not light my altar in vain. Malachi 1.10 They shall, and just for context, the laws that they were saying that they had to follow, they actually made. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have the Damascus document and the community rule. They also have the laws of the community or statutes and different instructions for what to do. And these were the things including purgations for washings, for uncleanness and things you had to do to separate yourself, but all of them without sacrifices because they could not do it as you could only do it in the Hekel and that was barred from them. So the transition between assemblies outside of the land, not keeping animal sacrifices was already in the works before our Mashiach even came. And those were all the, the, the sons of Louis and the Kohanim that turned to him as it mentions in, in Acts. Remember, the sons of Louis, also of Shimon, that's those who hear, believe, and do, but Louis are those who are joined unto him. It's a type of the remnant throughout the world. They don't have a nation of their own. They're all spread throughout. There's pictures there. says, they shall take care to act according to the exact interpretation of the law during the age of wickedness. They shall separate from the sons of the pit and shall keep away from the unclean riches of wickedness acquired by vow or anathema or from the temple treasure. Meaning anything that's been vowed to Yahuwah, you don't take. Anything that was under the ban, you don't take. They shall not rob the poor of his people to make of widows their prey and of the fatherless their victim. Yeshayahu 10.2 They shall distinguish between clean and unclean and shall proclaim the difference between kodesh and profane. They shall keep the Sabbath yom, day, according to its exact interpretation and the feasts and the yom of fasting according to the finding of the members of the new covenant in the land of Damascus. They shall set aside the Kodesh things according to the exact teaching concerning them. They shall love each man his brother as himself. They shall succor the poor, provide comfort, the needy and the stranger. A man shall seek his brother's well-being and shall not sin against his near kin. So, unlike Cain, you will be your brother's keeper, right? They shall not, or they shall keep from fornication according to the statute. They shall rebuke each man his brother according to the commandment, and shall bear no rancor from one day to the next. 
They shall keep apart from every uncleanness according to the statutes relating to each one, and no man shall defile his set-apart ruach, since Elohim has set them apart. For information on how to defile the ruach, it's in Kepha, explains it explicitly in the recognitions of Clement. If you ever get the PDF of it in Jackson Snyder's version, just look up Garments Unspotted, and you'll go right to that chapter. For all who walk in these precepts in perfect Kodeshah, set apartness, according to all the teaching of Elohim, the covenant of Elohim shall be an assurance that they shall live for thousands of generations, as it is written, keeping the covenant in favor with those who love me and keep my commandments to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 7.9 And if they live in camps according to the rule of the land, as it was from ancient times, marrying according to the custom of the law, and begetting children, they shall walk according to the law and according to the statute concerning binding vows, according to the rule of the law which says between a man and his wife and between a father and his son. Numbers 30.17 that was another thing I had mentioned before, but I don't know if I went into detail. A man is responsible for his house. His wife, if she says something, keeping a vow or says something of binding herself by an oath, when her husband hears it, he can annul that. And he's required to whenever it's something contrary to doing our Creator's instructions. Anything that is oblig obligatory on doing His will is supposed to be confirmed. In the same way, everyone who comes to our Creator and becomes His Son, He now hears of their binding oaths and likewise annuls or accepts those accordingly, which is why those that are involved in Jesuitism, witchcraft, Freemasonry, or any other occultic um, organization that has to swear an oath, they can be broken from that and freed because it's His will, and that's how that works. But on the reverse, on the same thing, just as the king, it says so with the king as with the people. And when the, the people were turning evil, when they were doing something that displeased our maker, Yahuwah permitted Satan to cause Dawid to number them, which was a sin that brought the plague. That same thing happens in a microcosm in a household. Every man is the king of his castle. Every wife is responsible to him. He's, uh, he's responsible for her and his children and everyone and all his property, everyone who works for them, everything is his. And if they are doing wrong, if there is a problem in their behavior, it can cause problems for the, the head of the household. You see that in the what I, the, I just mentioned with Dawid, and you get that explicitly again when you look at the shepherd of Hermas, as that very phenomenon was happening to him in his own household, because his children and wife were doing evils, it caused him to be uh, think a sinful thought and be corrected for it. So these things happen for purposes, and we want to be mindful, especially if you're in, in any position of authority as established by our maker, that what you're suffering and the things you're doing might not be when you do the thing you don't want to there could be a cause outside of yourself for it just a, another reason to be mindful prayerful and humble so it says and all those who despise the commandments and the statutes shall be rewarded with the retribution of the wicked when Elohim shall visit the land. His visitations, like when he came in our Mashiach, is described in the coming of the two Ruach Oath, or the two Ruach Oath that rule over every man, also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It gives you a list of the, the benefits or the detriment that will happen to you, depending on what Ruach you have in you at the time he visits you. And if you just take the time to look through that list, and then you look at how he interacted with people he healed, and then those that he turned away, you can see that it's exactly in line 
with what they were doing, the, the spirit or ruach in them. This is when the saying shall come to pass, which is written among the words of the foreteller Yeshiyahu, the son of Amotz, he will bring upon you and, abroad, and upon your people and upon your father's house days such as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Yahuda, Yeshiyahu 7.17. When the two houses of Yisrael were divided, Ephraim departed from Yahuda. And all apostates were given up to the sword. But those who held fast escaped to the land of the north. Talking about what's mentioned in 4th Ezra. As Elohim said, I will exile the tabernacle of your king and the bases of your statutes from my tent to Damascus. And that was that fleeing to go north to keep the law. They also kept... They kept their form of government by and large, and it's the common law of the Germans and Celts that we carry down into our country today, which is the scriptural principles applied. That is the law, the system of government we're supposed to be under in our country. It says, as Elohim said, I will exile, I already read that one, sorry. It says, the books of the law are the tabernacle of the king, the books of the law, the Torah, are the body or the dwelling of the king, the word made flesh, right? As Elohim said, I will raise up the tabernacle of Dawid, which is fallen, Amos 9, 2. The king is the congregation, right? We are his, as with the king, so with the people. He is our head, we are the body, right? And the bases of the statues are the books of the foretellers who saints Yisrael despised. The star is the interpreter of the law who shall come to Damascus. As it is written, a star shall come forth out of Yaakov, and a scepter shall arise out of Yisrael. Numbers 24, 17. The scepter is the prince of the whole congregation, and when he comes, he shall smite all the children of Seth or all the appointed children. It's where we get our word for set, or to place something. At the time of the former visitation, they were delivered, whereas the apostates were given up to the sword. And so shall it be for all the members of his covenant who do not hold steadfastly to these, to the curse of the precepts. They shall be visited for destruction by the hand of Belial. That shall be the day when Elohim will visit, as he said. The princes of Yahudah have become like those who remove the bond. Wrath shall be poured upon them, Hosea 5.10, for they shall hope for healing, but he will crush them. They are all of them rebels, for they have not turned from the way of traitors, but have wallowed in the ways of whoredom, and wicked wealth. If you look at the testament of Yahuda, he bemoans the witchcraft, lewdness, and the perversions of his children, that they would be like sea monsters over the people, like dragons and sea monsters as monarchs terrorizing the people. Okay? Foretold. And he cautions them about being mindful of wealth and uh well mixing with the woman of Cana on right like he did and being involved with witchcraft wealth and drinking or intoxication all the things that are happening with the uh the harlot there and those that are drinking of her cup spiritually says they have taken revenge and borne malice Every man against his brother, and every man has hated his fellow, and every man has sinned against his near kin, and has approached for unchastity, and has acted arrogantly for the sake of riches and gain. And every man has done that which seemed right in his eyes, and has chosen the stubbornness of his heart. They have not kept apart from the people and their sin, and have willfully rebelled by walking 
in the ways of the wicked of whom Elohim said, Their wine is the venom of serpents, the cruel poison of asps. Deuteronomy 32, 33. The sea monsters, or dragons, are the kings of the peoples, and their wine is their ways. And again, if you look at the testament of Yahuda, his children are the kings of the people that he said would be like dragons and sea monsters. Very same thing. And the head of the asp is the chief of the kings of Greece, who came to wreak vengeance upon them. But all these, that would be Antiochus Epiphans, possibly. But all these things, the builders of the wall and those who daub it with plaster, Ezekiel 13.10, have not comprehended, because a follower of the wind, one who raised storms and rained down lies, has preached to them, against all of whose assembly the anger of Elohim was kindled. The king, Zadik Yahu, didn't believe Yirmiyahu or Ye Yechez Ezekiel, right? Yechezkiel about his being blinded and taken into Babylon in captivity because their foretellings were not exactly in line. Like they, they, they confused him with one mentioning he would see the king and the other saying that he would be taken but wouldn't be able to see it. And then another one where he had the false foretellers leading them astray and false telling lies so they couldn't comprehend what was true because they weren't using discernment and it goes back to the wall builders okay you look at ezekiel look at what he's shown he dug through the wall he was shown all the inequity all the idolatries of the house of israel it's important to pay attention to that because it's still going on and as for that which Moshe said, you enter to possess these nations not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your hearts, Deuteronomy 9.5, but because Elohim loved your fathers and kept the oath, the oat, right? Deuteronomy 7.8. Thus shall it be with the converts of Yisrael who depart from the way of the people, because Elohim loved the first who testified in his favor, so will he love those who come after them. For the covenant of the fathers is theirs. And that's you, every one of us, who's hearing these things and turning, separating from the evil, just like our forefather Abraham. The covenant's meant for us. Yet he hated the builders of the wall, and his anger was kindled against them and against all those who followed them. And so shall it be for all who reject the commandments of Elohim and abandon them for the stubbornness of their hearts. This is the word which Yirmiyahu spoke to Baruch, son of Nariyahu, and which Elisha spoke to his servant Gehazi. None of the men who enter the new covenant in the land of Damascus and who again betray it and depart from the fountain of living waters shall be reckoned with the council of the people, the Yahad Kahal, right? Or inscribed in its book from the Yom of the gathering in of the teacher of the community until the coming of the Mashiach out of Aharon and Yisrael. That is the same as saying there is nothing but a fearful expectation of judgment for those who have been immersed partaken of the Shemayim gifts, been given of his Ruach, manifested miracles and powers in his name, and then turned from it. There's no forgiveness. It's like the messengers of above, they should know better. Okay? And that's part of his kindness towards us during these dark times where we don't have such powers and we can't, not everyone has their manifestations in these manners. And we are doing things without seeing, but yet believing, to which he says we're Baruch for doing so. And thus shall it be for every man who enters the congregation of men of perfect Kodeshah, but faints in performing the duties of the upright. He is a man who has melted in the furnace, Yechezkiel 22, 22. When his deeds are revealed, 
He shall be expelled from the congregation as though his lot had never fallen among the disciples of Elohim. The men of knowledge shall rebuke him in accordance with his sin against the time when he shall stand again before the assembly of the men of perfect Kodeshah. But when his deeds are revealed, according to the interpretation of the law in which the men of perfect Kodeshah walk, let no man defer to him with regard to money or work, for all the Kodeshim of the Most High have cursed him. And this was how they were living during the time when they separated from the people in the city. They went into the wilderness to keep the laws outside of, outside of it. They had their organization, if you will, was intolerable for people backsliding. You're done, you get, you're cut off. But it sounds harsh. You look at the rest of these things and you can see it's not any different from the heart of the Renewed Covenant writings. The guardian of the, of the, uh, the watch, I think, the guardian of the flock, the guardian of the congregation it might be, he's supposed to be like a father to them, diligently looking into everyone, inquiring and exhorting them to write ruling, just like an overseer is supposed to do, just like having the heart of our Mashiach, so the, the things are there. The difference is this is before he came. This is before there was the death for propitiation. So when they were done, you're cut off. They could not come back. There was no remedy for that. Unlike when you're in the renewed covenant, those that separate that were cut off and, and you know, out of that, by all means, he goes out to try to seek. Yahu Kanan has a great example of that in a story that's not in scripture, but you have the fact that he sent all of his taught ones to the lost sheep, his people who are currently wayward, right? Just to finish off real quick. And thus shall it be for all among the first and the last who reject the precepts, who set idols upon their hearts and walk in the stubbornness of their hearts. They shall have no share in the house of the Torah or law. They shall be judged in the same manner as their companions were judged who deserted to the scoffer. For they have wrong or spoken wrongly against the precepts of righteousness and have despised the covenant and the pact, the new covenant, which they made in the land of Damascus. Neither they nor their kin shall have any part in the house of the law. From the day of the gathering in of the teacher of the community until the end of all the men of the war, who deserted to the liar, there shall pass about forty years. Deuteronomy 2.14 And during that age, the wrath of Elohim shall be kindled against Yisrael. As he said, there shall be no king, no prince, no judge, no man to rebuke with righteousness. Hosea 3.4 and the Scythians, Scythians, for a long time, they had no king. There was no monarch over the people when they were taken out for a, at least 390 years. It wasn't until the liberation of Ephraim in the land there over in Madai, where they founded the Parthian Empire, that they had a monarch again under the Arsaxids, which were the, uh, the ruling class of the Sakai most likely of the sons of Dawid in dispersion with them because Dawid was foretold it perpetually to be reigning over the children. And when he, when Zadik Yahu was taken out of the land and his kingdom was removed from him, Yeremi Yahu took his daughter from Egypt, as is mentioned in the scriptures. Um, but what's not mentioned in, is in the Irish bard songs in what's called the Book of Tay Taffy, it's mentioned by Charles Totten. There's numerous books that have copied and wrote, written about these facts of history. But Yirmiyahu took Te Taffy, the youngest daughter of Zadik Yahu, and like the, the waning crescent moon going towards darkness, heading west, he took her and brought her to Ireland where she married the Hermon or the largest landholder of the sons of Zerah of Yahuda in the northern part of Ireland, and they founded the plantation or kingdom 
of Ulster, with the red hand of Zara, the Mogan Dawid, as their national emblems, and the lion of the tribe of Yahuda, of course. So, the perpetual reign of Dawid over the literal seed of Israel has been kept because his word is true. And that part was happening over there, even while all of the other ones were still in bondage and captivity, suffering the consequences of their choices in the Middle East and elsewhere at that time. Not everyone was suffering those things. Like I said, there's a lot more history that's going on, but his word is true. His children were scattered everywhere, and everyone got according to what they deserved. So this is from the day of the gathering. I already read that one. It says, And during that age, the wrath of Elohim shall be kindled against Yisrael, as he said. There shall be no king, no prince, no judge, no man to rebuke with righteousness. Hosea 3, 4. But those who turn from the sin of Yaakov, who keep the covenant of Elohim, shall then speak each man to his fellow, and to declare, write each man his brother that their step may take the way of Elohim. And Elohim will heed their words, and will shema or hearken, and a book of remembrance shall be written before him of them that fear Elohim and worship his name, against the time when deliverance and righteousness shall be revealed to them that fear Elohim, and then shall you distinguish once more between the righteous and the wicked, between the one that serves Elohim and the one that serves him not. Malachi 3.18 That second witness is also in the shepherd of Hermas where he's given a vision, two of them, of trees that are in the winter season and the righteous and the wicked are alike looking the same, and then the trees in the summer season where the righteous or the fruitful trees are blossoming and the dead trees are apparent. It says, And he will show loving kindness to thousands, to them that love him and watch for him, for a thousand generations. Shemoth or Exodus 20, verse 6. And every member of the house of separation who went out of the Kodesh city and leaned on Elohim at the time when Yisrael sinned and defiled the temple, but returned again to the way of the people in small matters, shall be judged according to his Ruach in the council of Kodeshah. But when the Elohim of esteem is made manifest to Yisrael, all those members of the covenant who have breached the bond of the law shall be cut off from the midst of the camp. And with them, all those who condemned Yahuda in the days of their trials. So, in a practical historical application, everyone who mixed was going to be judged by them for those that separated if they went back to the ways of the people. And it was when Yahushua came that it was those that were outside the that were breaching it were cut off by his ruach, making them not be believers. Okay. And everyone who condemned Yahuda or reviled those that were in ignorance or did something where they were against Yahuda, just like many people do today, are literally under a curse because that was foretold. Everyone who barocks Yahuda would be Baruch and everyone who curses him would be cursed. It's another reason why you're told not to speak evil of the leaders of your people. Because Yahuda has been given to do that. Something to keep in mind. Yet all those who hold fast to these precepts, going and coming in accordance with the law, who heed the voice of the teacher and confess before Elohim, saying, Amen, we have sinned, we and our fathers, by walking counter to the precepts of the covenant. Thy judgments upon us are right ruling in truth, who do not lift their hand against his Kodesh precepts, or his righteous statutes, or his true testimonies, who have learned from the former judgments by which the members of the community were judged. This is important. It's not just doing the things that you know to be written. It's seeing how they were judged. When you can look at the stories of our forefathers, you can see the accounts of men who had multiple wives. You can see how that went for them. You can see it was never beneficial. 
There was never a shalom or benefit from polygamy. Then you can judge that that's not a good thing and not do it. You can do that with every inference in his word. Look at the stories, read the accounts, become familiar with the literal history, cause and effect, and then don't do the things that cause problems. That's what we're all enjoined to do. It mentions that elsewhere in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. It says, Who have listened to the voice of the teacher of righteousness, Yahushua Mashiach, and have not despised the precepts of righteousness which they heard them, or when they heard them, like as you hear, so you do, right? And our Mashiach, just so you know, he said, Everyone believing in me and living shall never taste death at all. A lot of people don't, don't get what that means, but if you hear the truth, if you hear these words and you've determined that they are fact and you apply them to your life without deviating from those things again, you will never die. That's his promise. But people are careless and lazy in how they do things and we throw our lives away, literally through negligence. Sloth, slackness in the search for righteousness is literally a manifestation of the spirit of Satan in you. That's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the two Ruach Oath as well. It says, They shall rejoice, and their hearts shall be strong, and they shall prevail over all the sons of the earth. Elohim will forgive them, and they shall see his deliverance because they took refuge in his Kodesh name. Hallelujah. Thank you for that. Um, you all have a wonderful Shabbat and uh, Shavuot. Rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.